Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul, and I'm a nerd. We're having too much fun over here. Leanne is breathing heavy into the phone. We made her mute it. Um, this is the June 2013 virtual user group meeting for Practice Master users, and it is the first virtual user group meeting for Practice Master users. If you were in our meeting a, an hour ago, you know what I'm going to say. If you're not, you may be thinking, well, I've been to Practice Master virtual user group meetings before, but this is the first one that's geared specifically toward Practice Master. Up until today, everything uh, that we did as far as Practice Master and tabs was combined into one virtual user group meeting. So we used to call it the water cooler. Now the water cooler is a generic term that refers to all of our bugs. And we now have two for tabs and Practice Master, one for each. Uh, so this meeting will always be on the last Monday of the month, as it always was, but this specific one for Practice Master users only is going to be occurring at 2 o'clock, uh, just in case you're interested. The tabs 3 and accounting software virtual user group meeting will be at 1 o'clock, as it always was. So this is the inaugural episode, if you will, of the Practice Master virtual user group meeting. Today we are talking about converting to fee, one of Mary Jo's favorite topics, so we're going to let her go first and talk about that. A lot of the things that you do in Practice Master can be converted instantly to fees that instantly transfer over to tabs. So that email that you just journaled, or that note that you just made, or that task that you just checked off, or that uh, pretrial hearing or depo or trial that you just attended can be instantly converted into a fee. And it can be done so in such a way that it uh, is pretty easy, um, very quick and very easy to do. I, on the other hand, I'm going to talk about cleaning up your contact file. Now, some of you have gotten Practice Master recently. Others have had Practice Master for years. And so those of you who have may remember the change that occurred when we came from version 15.3 to version 16.1 and the way the contacts were done was changed and at that point a lot of you ended up with uh, a little bit of extra contact information than what you needed. So we're going to look at that, we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about how to fix it. Of course all these things that we're going to talk about also apply if you just need to rename a contact or combine two contacts into one because that's what we're going to be talking about. Now before we do that a little bit of preamble here. We're going to look at this. This is the GoTo webinar control panel. You either have this on your screen now or you did and you got rid of it. If you got rid of it, you did so by clicking this button that looks like arrows pointing to the right because that will shove this out of the way. And when you shove this out of the way using this button, this button will change into arrows pointing to the left. Clicking it again will cause this to come back into focus. You would want to bring it back into focus. Well, first off, you want to get rid of it because it may be covering up my screen and you may miss something that we're talking about. But you may want to bring it back into focus because this is where you type a question that Leanne, our humble moderator, will recognize, interrupt us at the appropriate time, and then ask your question on your behalf. So whatever questions you have, type them here, and Leanne will take care of you. If you find, as we are answering your questions, that you have additional questions, which we tend sometimes to create, uh, just keep typing them, and Leanne will keep asking them on your behalf until we've been sure to get that question answered for you. If instead you are not feeling shy at all, you can also click this button, which looks like a hand with an arrow pointing upward in front of it. That means raise your hand. Leanne will do the same thing. She'll recognize that you have a question. She will interrupt us at the appropriate time. But instead of Leanne reading your question, she will unmute you, and, and you'll get to ask your question directly. So whichever way you prefer, is fine with us, but by all means, be sure to ask those questions. Now I'm going to turn everything over to Mary Jo, and she is going to talk about converting to fees. Mary Jo? Okay. So most of the time when you are entering time to put into tabs to fill, a lot of times you're doing it normal activities or things in Practice Master, like creating calendar entries, creating journal notes, um, timer records, whatever you're working on, uh, and then you grab that little scratch pad or, or sheet of paper, write down your time, hand it off to your assistant to put that time in, or you are going in later opening the fee window and typing in what you did from something that you had written down. Um, just a lot of extra work, and you don't have to do that. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways that you can take the daily activities that you do in Practice Master and Outlook and just instantly convert that to a fee that's billable time, and how to set some settings um, so that some of that work is already pre
pre-entered in for you. So you don't even have to type in a lot of things. You can just click it and convert it to a fee. So we're going to make it as easy as possible. So we're going to start with um, some time. So let's go over to um, or a journal note or whatever. Let's go to a journal note. So let's say that we have uh, are in a matter and we create, let me see if I can find something in here, a, uh, a note. So let's come in and here's one that's actually already in here. Um, but let's create a new note. So this is just going to be a test note, um, conference with client, uh, talked about whatever. You can do paragraphs here in your note. Just like you're taking those notes on your legal pad, you can transfer that information into Practice Minister. Most of us know that we can do that. But what we don't know is over here in our quick clicks is a little convert to fee button. So if I've typed all this information in here, I might have three, four, five paragraphs in here, and I want to bill the client. If I hit my Convert to Fee button, first of all, it's going to ask me to save my journal note. And I say OK, and then it takes me right into a fee window. And it brought over my description. Now, this is a setting that we can change, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But in this case, I've got it defaulting to whatever I typed in my note. If this were three paragraphs, I would probably just highlight it and delete it and come in and change it to Conference with Client, because that's what I want to show on the bill. I can round up my time. I can say that this was you know, four hours, whatever that was, and then save it. And instantly, I've created that uh, fee that goes out to tabs and is instantly on the client's bill, ready to bill. Plus, I've maintained my journal note in its entirety to refer back to or add to later. So I've kind of combined that step. Now, you can set your settings to default to being blank, so you don't bring over that full description you've typed. Um, and you might change that for different types of records. For a note, for instance, I might want that to come over blank because I don't want my three paragraphs. I don't want that extra step of highlighting and deleting. But for a calendar entry or an email, maybe I do want all that information that is in that record to come over and be able to bill and have it on the bill. So there's different instances that you might want different settings. And for each type of record, you can change that. So that makes it really cool. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this. And I'm going to show you that now I've got my note here. And if I go back out here and I go to my fees, which I'm not showing on this window. <laughs> Whoops. Let me go out here and put it on there. Let me get my fee tab. And there it is. OK. So now I've got my fee. So if I come back over here for Daniel Klein and I scroll down here to the bottom, I will have my conference of client fee. And there's that with that entry, uh, that description. I come out and I go back into my uh, note, and I still have my note on there. And you'll also see that I've got this little P here under my status. And what that means is that this fee record has been processed. I have processed it into um, a fee. It's a no I'm sorry, this note has been processed. You'll notice the one up above is unprocessed. That's a U. If I, and I know we're going to talk about you know, how to convert these or uh, process records next month, I believe. Is that correct? So um, I'm not going to get into that a whole lot, but you can go back and convert fees that have a U in here. And you can come over, and if I wanted to bill for this particular note and I hit convert to fee, it will open a fee window. And then when I get done and save it, that will turn to a P. So that is uh, a really cool feature that you can do just in the notes. Um, and again, I'm going to go over to calendar. And we're going to do one for the calendar. Uh, I don't know if I'm showing. I'm not showing a lot of the, the tabs up here that I normally have. So I'm just going to go into my calendar. And I'm going to grab one of these fee, uh, these calendar records. So let's say that this meeting with Roger Nelson at 9.30, I want to convert that to a fee. If I open that record, you'll see I've got the convert to fee again. And so if I click on that, it's going to ask me which client because I wasn't in a client record. Uh, so I can choose the client I want to bill. We'll just put this on Michael Larson. Say OK, and there I've got a fee record already there with what I did. It's taking in the meeting with Roger Nelson and then all of the information. And this information here is coming from my, if I move this over just a little bit, you'll see that I had the meeting with Roger Nelson as my description, and it also has my comments. And so that can come over here and be put in. And that goes right to the bill. If I want to change it, I can highlight and change it to what I want the bill to say if this were something different and save it, and I've billed that time. And it took the time this meeting was from 9.30 to 11. So it assumed that I wanted to build that full hour and a half for that meeting. You can adjust that, and then save it, and then that's what goes over if it's not the right time. So that's a place that you can do it.
the biggest place that I see this come into play and people use most often is in Outlook. And I don't, can I go into, okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure what, what I was going to bring up here when I opened Paul's email, so I apologize, Paul, in advance. But um, So if I have Outlook open and I wanted to convert um, a fee from Outlook, I can come in and I'm just going to take this particular um, message here, I'm, I'm on Practice Master, I can just hit the fee button and I can bill for that email right from here. A lot of people know that you can journal an email from here and they'll journal that and put it over into Practice Master, but you can also bill. If this isn't something you want to journal and you just want to bill the time, you can come in and hit fee. Again, it's going to ask you which client you want to put it under. We can pick one and go ahead and save it and it's creating that fee record. Now I'm going to show you a little bit about the settings and how to default things because the biggest thing is you want to default this timekeeper to being you, the person that's going to be actually converting it, or if you're an assistant, you want those convert to fee settings to be for the attorney that you're working for. Now if you, um, and let me save this one here, um, oh okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you were, were a legal assistant and you wanted to bill uh, you, you bill for multiple attorneys. Uh, you do work for you know, three or four attorneys. You can set it so that it will let you choose whoever the, the, the client's default primary timekeeper is. Or you know, there's some different settings there for you. So if you're an attorney and you're billing your own time, you're going to want to set that to be for you. And then you're going to want to pick your settings. Do you want the description to show? Do you not want it to show? Do you want to bill minimums of a tenth, round to the nearest tenth? There's all kinds of little things in there that I'm going to show you. Now, Paul brought up a point here. We have some columns in here as well. We have a little J, that means journal, C for calendar, and F for fee. And since I build that, I have a little F in here. So it's showing me I've already billed for this particular email. So if I come back at the end of the day and I want to see which time I've already billed for, we've got this little column here to tell me I've already billed for this one. And so that's there. So let me get back into Practice Master and show you some of these settings. Let me get that out of there. So where you find the Convert to Fee settings is under Maintenance, under Preferences, and then under Convert to Fee settings. You'll notice at the top we've got uh, six different tabs one for each type of record that we can convert to a fee. So when we start on the calendar, we can default this to a particular transaction code or task code or activity code. Um, a lot of times for calendar that might change. Um, email, you might have a, tra a transaction code for email and you want it to start with email to kind of help that description along. Um, so there are some that you may want to set a transaction code. Um, others you can just leave it, ours one is blank, so it just kind of, if we use that as one, um, the default timekeeper, that's important. If you wanted to always use timekeeper, you know, whatever your timekeeper number is because you're the one converting the fee, this is where you would set that. You can also default to the timekeeper used for the last fee or for the client's primary timekeeper. And this is the one that I'm telling if you work for several attorneys, you probably want to set it to something like this so that you, know, you can always change it. You can always change the fee entry, but this will help you so you don't have to change it so often. The default description, right now this one is defaulting to a customized description, and I'll show you that in a minute, but you can default to the description field. That's what you've typed. So if you've typed something in that field, it'll default to whatever you've typed to put into the fee entry. You can default to the transaction code, activity code description. So in my example for the email, if I were choosing the transaction code that corresponded to email, and I choose this box, it will say whatever that transaction code description is for my shortcut. The customized description, I'm going to click edit, lets you pick and choose what you want to show in the description. And you saw when I converted the calendar uh, record, it had the description and the comments. So you can see here it's got the description, start time, through the end time, and the comments. It's put all of that information in my description. And you can pick and choose any of these fields that are over here on the left, and you can add them in whatever order that you want them to appear over here on the custom description. So that makes it really handy. And every I'll show you in the other um, types of records up here, but these change depending on what kind of a record you're in. So all these are basically calendar uh, fields that are available that I can add over here. So in this instance, they've got this set up in our test data to use that customized description. And they've also got it set up to default to billing a minimum of a quarter of an hour and it's rounding it to the nearest quarter of an hour. Um, so if you bill in tenths, 
this could be point 0.1 and point 0.1, however you want that set up. And again, it's always changeable in the actual fee entry. It's just the, the default that's going to pop in there. If I go to my email, I can again use a transaction code. This one they're doing communicate with, but you could have one that said email to, from, something like that. Again, the same timekeeper things apply, and you do have to set these for each tab. Um, the biggest mistake I see is people come in and they do it for the calendar, but then it's not showing up for the other tab. So you have to go through each tab and set the timekeeper for each type of record. So if you process emails for one timekeeper, but you always process the notes for another, you could technically set that up for those particular timekeepers. Um, if it's yourself, this will always be you up here. Again, they've set up a customized description. You could either use the comments field or the transaction code activity code. In this instance, they put communicate with, which is a transaction code, to from via email and regarding the subject. So all of these fields are different because these fields refer to email fields. Again, the tenth of an hour, we usually will round to the nearest tenth, or if you're combining several uh, emails, you can round that to um, the nearest tenth when it's combined. And Paul will talk a little bit more about that next month uh, when we talk about processing timer records, but um, this is where you can set that when you're doing multiple fees, or multiple records, I'm sorry. The note tab, same thing up at the top. You can put in a transaction code or task code activity code, same thing with the timekeepers, description, T code, or customize, and then the tenths of an hour. Also with the phone, the only difference with phone research and timer, a lot of times you can set timer records. Um, when, you, when you have a timer going, um, you can do different types of timers, a phone timer, a research timer, or a timer task. And those can be rounded to the nearest tenth and, and bill a minimum of a tenth. So you've got a few more options here to add that tenth. And normally when I come in, I will just do each one of these and I'll have everything set to tenth. Um, and that way it just automatically rounds for me and does the default. So all these screens, same thing, and then the timer. Um, I did not do the timer. I um, am going to be talking about that a little bit more next month, so I'll get into that with converting. But there is a convert to fee as well. So if I open a timer record, and I'm going to move this down, um, it would already have kept track of how much time I had done. And if I hit my convert to fee, that's, again, where that rounding to the nearest tenth or billing a minimum of a tenth will come into play. And once that's converted, again, it saves my description as I want for my fee record, and it saves my journal note. Uh, just another way to speed up capturing time, uh, taking out some of the steps, and also eliminating lost time. If you're billing it right away, uh, billing the emails as you read them, billing the um, calendars after the you know records after you've done them, it just speeds it up, and it's already on the bill, and it eliminates all that other activity. Any questions? No questions, Mary Jo. You must have done a really good job because there's no questions. Okay, I am going to talk about contacts and cleaning them up specifically. Uh, we'll assume that people know how to put contacts in. and Maybe that'll be something we talk about at another virtual user group meeting. But right now we're going to talk about what to do when you have two that you want to combine into one or you have one that has a, a bad name. Now, first off, let me, uh, let me go over to the... Hey, Paul. Yes. I hate to interrupt. We have a, a incoming question, I think, for Mary Jo. Okay. Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. How do we add the toolbars to Outlook to see the F for the fee? Okay. What we have to do for that is you have to journal one email first. Uh, they aren't available until you've journaled one email into Practice Master. Oh, for, and so and show how to add the toolbars also. Okay. So you need to have the the. Uh, integration toolbar plugins put in. So under integration, there's a little toolbar plugin. And so when we click on that, we have different toolbars that we can put into all these different programs. So we first have to have the toolbar in there. So you have to install the Outlook toolbar. And then if you want to put it in Internet Explorer, Word, Excel, Adobe, Word Perfect, all of those things, you can also install those. They take about <laughs> two to five seconds to install, and then you've got that over there. Once you've got the toolbar there, you will have a little practice master, well, depending on the version, I should say. It might be under add-ins, it might be practice master, um, depending on your version of Outlook. Uh, but here we, it's under practice master, and that's where we have these different uh, options here. To get the little J, C, and F, 
you have to journal an email first. So I have to come in and I have to hit journal and journal it to somebody. It can be a junk email journal to a junk client. It doesn't matter. You just have to journal one. And then once you've done that, then you, there's some little hoops you go through to um, view your settings for uh, your view. And there's columns. And then you can format the columns. And so I'm just viewing my settings. If I go into columns and I go to my user defined, they're already over here, but this journal calendar and fee would be on this side. And I just move them over and I always move them up to the top. And once those are saved here, I can say OK. It takes me back out here. And then I just take it, instead of it saying journal PM, that would take up half my, my space. I just rename that to J and I make it two. Uh, I go. I think two is the lowest that you can go. The C, I make that. You know, I just change it to a C, and the fee I change to an F, and I just make that two. And I think normally, if I put two, it must default it up to to auto fit the columns there for the characters. But and then I say okay, and then once I journal it, that's what appears there. Now you'll see the view that I have. This is the view that you need to to have with your preview screen down. You need enough room for these columns, otherwise it's going to push your subject and your from and your date out of the range. So just be careful with your views. We can help you set that up. Um, I know Paul's got to get on with his contacts. So if you have more questions on that, we can help you out with that. Any more questions, Leanne? No more questions. OK, we'll move on to contacts. And I'm going to go ahead and go into contacts. Uh, when we came from version 15.3 to version 16.1, um, clients had not been contacts before, so everybody that was a client had a contact record automatically created for them. In many firms, this created lots of duplicate contacts. Let's say, for instance, that you have 100 cases for a uh, State Farm Insurance Company, and that you have, throughout the years, as you've been putting these cases in, somebody put 101 Jones Parkway and another person put 101 Jones PKWY, and somebody put Suite 102, and somebody else put STE 102. Well, when Practice Master did its conversion and made contacts out of these clients, uh, it tried to bring these together, but it didn't do a great job when you had those sorts of situations. It kind of erred on the side of safety, and so you would have five or six different contact directors created from the various combinations of Suite and Parkway and its abbreviation when you ended up after the conversion. Now, it's, 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 it's ugly, but it's pretty easy to fix. I've gone down here for Mega Construction Corporation, and I've kind of replicated what that would look like, except in my example, there'd be a whole bunch more. Okay, So, um, I've actually done it up. I want to do it up here because I think that the one that was created, that I created as a fake one for David Hill, kind of shows it a little better. I think what I did was, and I didn't even actually, one of them may have had street without a period, OK? And I'm going to go ahead. So here's an example of, you know, we've got street, oops, we've got street and we've got street with a period. They're both really the same record. If you look very closely, they're identical. I'm going back and forth between them right now by pressing the F3 and F4 keys. The only thing that's different is you've got this one to designate this difference. One's got a period, one doesn't. And just for giggles, I, I added another wrinkle to it by making one assigned to one user group and one assigned to another user group. We'll get into that in a second. It's very easy to merge these together. Now, keep in mind, if it really was State Farm, and State Farm had four different offices, one in Indianapolis, one in Cleveland, one in Pittsburgh, and one in Detroit. Uh, I would want to make sure to combine the Detroits into one and the Pittsburghs into one, but I wouldn't want to combine them all into one because obviously you need separate records. So first off, let's look at how to combine them. We go up to maintenance and renumber and merge contacts. It will prompt you to back up, and I recommend you do that just when you come in the first time. And it'll ask you who the first one is. And I'm going to say Hill, and it's going to let me pick David A. And I'm going to say Hill for the second one, and I'm going to pick the second record. And what it does is it shows me all the fields that have different data. Now, this one, we don't care that it's different. So you can click on whichever field you want to keep. 
and the field that you click on will become green. And when we merge this record together, the fields that are green will be the ones that will result. So the contact ID will stay at Dave Hills slash David A. The uh, ST with a period wins, and that's the address that we use. We want David A instead of David A1. That, that's just kind of the way it made it when I made this sample piece of data. And these two. I want to talk about these two. There is a field in your contact. I'm going to close this out for a second and talk about that. There's a field in your contact record called user group, and this has to do with Outlook synchronization. If you are synchronizing your contacts in Practice Master with Outlook, this field tells Practice Master whose Outlook to put David A. Hill into. And in this example, this record is merging with Cheryl. Oops, went the wrong way. And this record is merging with Jen. You'll notice when we go into Merge, Maintenance, Renumber, Merge Contacts. And when we select both records, that this is letting us select which field takes precedence, but it is not going to merge the fields. It's not going to pull these two values together so that when the final record is, is, is pulled together, it's set to hook into both Jen's and Cheryl's Outlook. So you have to be very, very careful of that if you have Outlook synchronization turned on and you run into records that you want to merge that are going to different people. You have to make a note, and when you're done, you need to go to the resultant record and add Jen back in because she will not be there because we can't say we want both. There's no way to say take both and put them together. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and merge this, and it's going to do it. What it does is it actually merges them together, and anything that pointed to either of those two, because as you know, things can point to contacts in Practice Master and in tabs, they were all merged together too. So it does everything it needs to do. It pulls the two records together, and any references to either of the two records are now create, uh, corrected to point to the right place. The only thing we have to remember to do here is come back here and add Jen as the second user for Outlook synchronization and now we have a perfectly combined record. Now, in my example, it's all very simple. It was a street that had a period and didn't. There's some messy stuff that some people have to clean up. And so sometimes you have to actually go look and see, OK, well, we had one record where this guy was at this address and another record where he's at this address, which is two blocks away. Which is really his address, or is, does he really have two addresses? So there's, there's more to it. And I'm really just showing you how to pull the records together. The thing about merging contacts and cleaning them up is you have to know what you're dealing with. So sometimes it takes a little legwork. Uh, sometimes in a firm there's somebody who knows all these answers. More often than not, the person who's doing this merging is going to need to get some people on the phone, the legal assistant that works for the attorney that has this contact as a client, or the person in billing that knows whether the bills need to go to this address or that address, or whether this address is even valid. Now, another thing that could happen, as I mentioned, is, as is my example with mega uh, construction down here, you could actually have somebody that has two addresses, and instead of merging them together, you simply want to give the second one a name that is meaningful. Let's say Mega Construction Corporation has an office in Manhattan, New York. Do they really call it Manhattan, New York? Don't they call it New York, New York? I've always wondered about that. We won't go into that. And they also have an office on Mega Lane in Boulder, Colorado. So we don't want to merge these together. These are two offices for Mega Construction Corporation. Instead, what we want to do is we want to give them contact IDs that are meaningful and yet make sure that their full name is, uh, makes sense. So instead of having this called Mega Construction Corporation 1 for the contact ID, I think it would be appropriate to call it Mega Construction Corporation Boulder. So I'm going to go into Maintenance and Rename Contact, and I'm going to take Mega 1, and I'm going to change it to Mega Boulder. It asks, do you want to update the full name? I do. In fact, I really want to get this Boulder out of there. Boulder is a designation for us to know 
in the contact ID that this is the Boulder office from Mega Construction Corporation. But I want this field here, this full name, to remain Mega Construction Corporation. I would not send a letter to somebody at Mega Construction Corporation, friends, Boulder, close friends. I would send a letter to Mega Construction Corporation, but I want this Boulder in the contact ID, which is a separate field, to help me understand which office I'm picking. So I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to take the other Mega Construction Corporation, not the non-Boulder one, and I'm going to change its contact ID to be Manhattan. I think I spelled that right. We'll see. Someone will tell me if I didn't. Hmm? And now, when I look at this, I now have names over here that identify not only that it's Mega Construction Corporation, but which city they're in. Okay. So in my example, um, I usually pick on Gallagher Bassett because the first two conversions that we did were at um, large insurance defense firms in Indianapolis. Gallagher Bassett is an insurance company that's headquartered in Indianapolis. And uh, at one of the firms, uh, well, at both of them, they ended up with a lot of Gallagher Bassett records in the contact file. Now, Gallagher Bassett has three or four or five offices, uh, but these firms were ending up with you know, 27, 28, 29 different contact records for Gallagher Bassett. So in that instance, we're dealing with a combination of combining or merging these contacts into the appropriate different geographical locations. So taking these six and merging them into one, and these five and merging them into one, because this one's Indy and this one's Boulder, and then renaming them using the rename contact to change their name to mean something that indicates what city they're in, instead of having five Gallagher Bassets and having to look individually at each record to know which one's in Boulder and which one's in Indianapolis. Now, just so you know, and this wasn't true in earlier versions, so if you have a later, an earlier version of 16.1 or perhaps 16.2, rename contact has now been moved back out here. So all you have to do really to rename a contact is highlight it and press this button in quick clicks. If you don't want to expose your quick clicks pane, you can also right click and choose action, and rename contact will be in there. Merge contact, you still need to go into maintenance, renumber, and merge contacts. It's a little weird because you're not really renumbering, and even when you're renaming, but both rename and merge contacts also appear under that menu. Okay. Questions? No questions at this point. Awesome. Well, we will uh, bid you adieu, but before we do, we'll tell you that next month in our Practice Master Virtual User Group meeting, which again is the last Monday of the month at 2 o'clock, we will be talking about the timer. Mary Jo will talk about the timer. It is her favorite thing to do. That's how she keeps track of her time. And I'm going to talk about processing timer records. Mary Jo kind of alluded to this. She showed you how to convert to fee in a one-off sort of thing. I'm going to show you how to take all the things you did since the last time you converted for process timer records and get a list of them and convert them all in mass, kind of uh, uh, end of day sort of thing. Uh, oh, and Paul. just in case, yes. Speaking of that, I do have a question, so I don't know if you want to take that yeah, now. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, is there a bulk way to do these um, merging? No, it's two at a time. You can't say, I have these six records and I need to merge them all into one. You merge two of them, and then you merge another against that merged, and you just keep doing it until you've got one. There is no way to do more than two at a time. OK, next question. With the remaining contacts, um, oh, with renaming contacts, I'm sorry, um, can you have the computer find duplicates, Alexi, and us to choose the choose or rename? With sorry, I'm having a hard time reading this question. Well, I think what they're asking is how do you know what the duplicates are? And there are a couple ways. There's a report that comes with Practice Master, that if we go into the report writer, which is reports, report writer, that's where I am, and then sort by title, and you can run duplicate contacts. Now, this particular one only looks for contacts that have a parenthesis in their name. Because when Practice Master came through and did its conversion, it took the duplicates and called them PRENS1, PRENS2, PRENS3, PRENS4, and so on. So I think uh, that's a good way to start. 
But then I think you should also just come into your contact list, sort it by contact ID, and scan through it. Because what you're going to find is that your duplicates will be pretty close together here. Now, if the duplicates aren't close together because maybe you have um, Lewis Joseph M like this appears, but you also have a Lewis comma III because he happens to be Joseph M Lewis the third, or, or or just plain Joseph Lewis with no slash between them. Um, those I, I can't really tell you a, a, a spectacularly wonderful way to find them. Uh, only that when you do find them, you're, you're going to want to merge them together as quickly as possible, especially those because they're so hard to come across. Any more, Leanne? No, no more questions. Okay. So um, we talked about the topics for next month's practice master virtual user group meeting. Uh, in case you're interested, the tab three virtual user group meeting next month uh, is uh, same day, but it's at 1 o'clock. And we will be talking about trust integration with tabs. Mary Jo will talk about that. And I will be talk, talking about making rules on a matter level to figure out how the money gets divvied up. We call them fee compensation rules. So uh, that's it for today. Everybody have a good Good day and a good month, and we will see you next month. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.